The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, a 1962 film directed by one of America's premier directors, John Ford. John Ford. Anytime you have a director today who talks a lot about like their influences and stuff, John Ford usually comes up. I know that Spielberg especially um, has always claimed that John Ford is an inspiration to him. Ford was mostly known as a director of Westerns, but he always, he directed some of the greatest Westerns ever made. This, this one, he directed a great film called The Searchers from 1956. Um, that also has John Wayne. He did the Grapes of Wrath film in 1940, Henry Fonda. The Grapes of Wrath film was just as popular as the book. So um, it's tons of other ones. He did Stagecoach. Um, I'm pretty sure he did like The Longest Day, the D-Day movie from, from the 60s. So he, this guy's career was huge. It went from the 40s through the, not even the 40s, the 30s, the 30s through the, through the 60s. He did, he did, I think, close to 100 films in his lifetime. So um, anytime I teach this class, one of his movies comes up. Last semester, I did two of his movies with Grapes of Wrath and The Searchers. And this time I'm doing Liberty Valance. So um, oftentimes, like he's known for directing like lots of action scenes and things like that. Most of the time his movies are in collar. Ooh, the Searchers came out five, five or six years before this and it's in full collar. But he chose black and white as his medium for this one. So um, most of the time, Ford's movie star, John Wayne. John Wayne, John Wayne, I'll be interested to hear what you guys have to say about him. But, but when Wayne was in movies that were not with Ford, you know, lots of times, they were more or less the cookie cutter type of westerns. Um, very much, very much so the cookie cutter westerns, right? And Wayne was always the hero. Um, he didn't really have any gray to his characters, right? He was always the good guy standing up against the bad guys. You know, it didn't matter how much violence it took. I told you guys about Rio Bravo the other day, his um, answer to High Noon, like Rio Bravo, where he made the other townspeople just as heroic as him. Ford, though, Ford, though, tended to get very nuanced performances out of, this, out of John Wayne. John, John Wayne's actually a very good actor. Um, it takes he had to kind of strong arm him into doing it, I suppose. He's, he's actually a very strong actor. He can play really strong, interesting characters. Tom Donovan is one of them. One of his uh, best roles that he ever did. So um, he's an icon. He's an icon, right? He's the Duke. When it comes to Western films, it's him and Clint Eastwood, right? It's the two major icons of that genre. Of course, we'll see an Eastwood film next week with Unforgiven. But uh, I'll, be, I'll be especially interested to hear what you guys have to say today about John Wayne's performance and, and um, what she made it, what she made of it, because it's very much a different type of performance for John Wayne. Then, of course, Jimmy Stewart, right? He plays Ransom Stoddard. Stewart was one of the most popular actors of the 50s and 60s. 
you guys probably all know him from the Christmas film, right? It's a Wonderful Life. You know, that, that's his, that's one of his, his iconic roles. I think it. I think it was somebody talked about on the discussion board. You've seen him in Hitchcock, right? Vertigo, right? He's also real known for that film, Vertigo, and this one as well. So he's got Jimmy Stewart has that iconic voice. Okay? He's his voice. His voice is something you don't not here once you hear it. Right? He's got one of those interesting voices I've always thought. This was the first first time these two big movie actors had ever been on together in one film. So that was kind of a big occasion. Then he got Lee Marvin who plays Liberty. Right. Lee Marvin, what a great character actor. Right. He oftentimes plays these bad guys, these really bad boy types. Right. I could name a bunch of uh, – I've seen Lee Marvin in a bunch of films. He also has that type of iconic voice, right? Dude, I'm going to shoot you right between the eyes, right? He, he's, got that, he's got that iconic voice as well. It's, it's hard to forget once you've – once you've heard it. It's hard to argue that this film would be as successful as it was without his performance. Like this guy is menacing. He's nasty. This is a guy you don't want to mess with. Or, or cross. Uh honestly, I think the people like, you know, the guy who played Liberty Balance, I think those type of people truly make or break a movie. Like in The Walking Dead, it got so boring. And then they introduced Negan, and it got good again because he was actually a very interesting, gritty villain, and I enjoyed that. And I also enjoyed Liberty Valance because he was just, I don't know, he was a bad guy for the sake of being a bad guy. You know, it's not like he had a sad, tragic past. It's just, I'm a bad dude. I love that. Yeah. Right. It's lots of times these movies try to overdo it, right? They try to give the character, the bad guy, too much depth. Right? It's, this guy's just bad to the bone, right? <laughs> that's, really, that's really the only way you can describe it. He's a hired gun, though, right? He's so the ranchers want to hire him in the movie, right? Because the, they don't want, the ranchers don't want the West civilized. They want it all to be open range for their cattle. Right? So that's that was a big conflict in American history right? between the ranchers out west and the uh, you know and people who were moving out there. Right, people started making farms and making towns and all that. Right, that stopped the ranchers from having all the open land that they wanted be able to roam around it hurt their business right so the, the ranchers versus the homesteaders so that type of thing often often resulted in conflict so um you see that you see that type of plot show up in a bunch of different westerns shane is also another great film where that plot line shows up um, talking about like civilizing the West, I'll never forget one thing that my history teacher told uh, to me. He said the three things that civilized the West were Bob Wire, excuse my French, boobies, and bad boys. Because Bob Wire was invented, you know, to uh, like originally it was to split land and keep cattle in certain areas. And so it restricted the need for cowboys to, you know, direct them and make them go across lands and herds. And then obviously I talked about it the other day, but women basically civilized the West with their bodies. Uh, and, you know, we had hired guns that, uh, you know, had to keep uh, poachers and stuff like that off of, uh, you know, Bob wired land. That's Liberty's role, right? 
And of course, this movie is all about the civilizing of the West, right? The development of the West, even the death of the West as a as a concept. By the end of the movie, the West no longer exists, right? It's pretty much just like any other part of America. So um, Jimmy Stewart kind of brings civilization to the West, and it's no longer the open, free place that it once was. So this movie, this movie's great. Right? It has lots of. Um, it's it's got its plot, right? But it's got some strong. And political messages in it, which I'm going to be interested to help unpack with you all today. It's, it's very, this movie's very political. You know, Keegan, Keegan wrote a lot about um, the politics of the movie today, so we'll definitely get you up in a second, Keegan. Yeah, so um, I'll just, uh, as always, I'll turn the floor over. You guys, um, what's your thoughts on the film? How did you guys respond to it? How was it as a second Western after after High Noon? Uh, compared to High Noon, it was definitely different because it met and then broke my expectations for what I thought was going to happen. Um, I did really like that we had two people that embodied two opposing ideas. So we've got John Wayne playing a character who has to, you know, has to symbolize the West and the freedom of being a cowboy and all that. And then we've got another character who is his literal job is trying to civilize the West and, you know, bring you know industry and like an era of you know business into the west and it's interesting to see two you know completely opposed like day and night characters uh having to have a conflict in this, uh in a western because normally we don't think of westerns as like oh you know they deal with intense socio-political issues but whenever we have this it's very interesting to see that there's something deeper than just, you know, a high noon showdown gunfight. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's not just a simple case of good versus bad, right? You know, both sides have their gray areas here, right? I think, I think you're right to point that out, Will. What about the rest of you? What's your t- hot takes on, on the film? Especially, especially interested to hear what you guys have to say about the performances. Uh, Aaliyah Carpenter said, high noon set a high bar, not as good. Well, you got to tell us why, Aaliyah. Give, it, give us reasons. Now what some of you guys in Logan think about the film? I like John Wayne's character a lot. Why so? I like how he uh, was actually the one who killed Liberty, but even though he knew he'd done it, he kept it to himself. He didn't care about the well, I mean, he told in the end, but he didn't care about, the, you know, the reward or the whole I did it that praised him. Right. Yeah, that's that's the big swerve in the movie, right? I, I, told, uh, you guys, I told you guys there's a big plot twist. That's the, that's the one. I was, I was actually waiting for somebody to mention this because I had a very strong opinion about this. Uh, I found it very... Uh, uh, Passa non grata, the fact that his character is supposed to embody the West and be very, you know, manly and like have these very gritty, like ideals or whatever. Yet he kills a man from the shadows, like an assassin in the night, and doesn't tell anybody and in fact lies whenever he's asked about it and then proceeds to be mad 
and burn a woman's house down. Like, he, compl- and I also talked about this, but he completely flips his character on his head, not only as a moral dilemma, but as well as, like, a persona change. You know, because the, the entire movie were presented with this, like, oh, I'm a rough and tumble cowboy. And then he shoots someone in the, uh, from the dark. And I'm like, you're just, uh, you're, you're just as bad as the people that you have a problem with. Right, it's it's definitely a big gray area in this film, right? You know, um, especially for John Wayne, right? You know, he, but what if he wouldn't have done this, right? What if Jimmy Stewart would have been gunned down cold in the street? Right? Liberty Balance would have won. Vigilantes would have won. So it, t- it almost took an act of strong vigilante justice to. Uh, to bring civilization to the West, right? He, he kind of had to take one for the greater good. If you want to look at it that way. Violence, violence had to come in somewhere, right? You know, if, yeah. I think it was fine how he did. Me, personally, I don't care how you get, you know, a kill or whatever, but for him being presented to us as a hero, you know, like, we oftentimes think of people like ninjas as like, oh, you know, they're very like cool or whatever. But in like Japanese culture, shinobi were very like looked down upon because you're killing somebody in the night and in shadow. You're not having an honorable fight with them. And I feel like that can be extended to like, you know, because duels were very much a thing, not always dramatically in the center of town, but you know, they were a public event that happened, and it was in the middle of the day that it happened, you know, so it's very much an honorable thing, unlike, you know, just, you know, just shooting somebody in the dark. It's very uh, cowardly from the perspective of the main character. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're right to point that out, Will. There's lots of similarities between Westerns and Japanese like especially like samurai culture and stuff, right? Yeah, samurai yeah. were not in the honorable, the honorable fighters, right? Whereas the ninjas were the were the cowards, right? Uh, Elias said, "I like that High Noon just got to the point. Liberty also kind of got me upset. There was just too far a line between good and bad." Too fine a line between good and bad. That's that's an interesting thought. Um, of course, uh, of course, the her, her direct Elias comment, right? Is is that how real life is? Right? Is real life not so cut and dry? Like normally, even in like a western, the, the hero will be wearing white, right? The 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 villain will be wearing black, right? It, is Western, is the real world not so clear cut, right? Between good and evil. Yeah. Uh, a good example of that is like, you know, like the tale of Arthur and the, the knights and stuff like that. Like, you know, we're always shown that his lore is very much, oh, he's the king of Camelot and he's an honorable knight and so are all his knights. But something we don't ever get the side of with that is somebody's knight is somebody else's, like, villain. Uh, So, you know, like, everybody has different perspectives on everything. So it's like, you know, people want the West to be civilized. That's, you know, fine and dandy. People want it to remain wild and free. And, you know, you just have two sides of the same coin because they're both involved in the society. However, whenever you have one person who killed your family for the sake of their king, you know, that's, you know, conquering your land, but they are thinking they're doing the right thing, you know. Very much, history is very morally gray when it comes to stuff like that, but we view, like, whoever the winners are as, like, you know, oh, they're the best people. And in in a genre that's all about the civilizing of America, right? America is this great place, this great moral example 
the rest of the world will follow when this type of film shows that even the creation of of the country was a very grave process right you know that's that's awesome Well, let's get let's get more people in here besides just me and Will and Aaliyah. Yeah, or Keegan, you talked about John Wayne's role in the film. Tell me, tell me what you wrote about. Throw your points out there for me. Uh, John Wayne, his function really summed up was to save Ransom because Ransom, I think, would have died right there. Right. To kill Liberty and to not be the hero. Because Ransom kind of already had the – the girl was already liking Ransom. And that's what really – that was kind of John Wayne's downfall in the movie. That's what made him, like, kind of upset in the end and then to burn the house down and all that. So how, how did that maybe – did that sort of character arch, did that surprise you any, Keegan? Uh – a little bit. I thought, you know, it's John Wayne. He's going to get the girl, but he, but he didn't in this movie. But I mean, I, I, I like John Wayne throughout the movie, though. I think, I think he was kind of bad A in the movie. You know, I like how he called Ransom Pilgrim. A yeah. Bad answer. Yeah. I, th- I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, you still get lots of references to that in different types of media today, right? Where, John Wayne calls everybody pilgrim in the movie, right? It kind of makes me want to call somebody a pilgrim now. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you go to the gas station, right? Thank you, pilgrim. Wait, what's up, pilgrim? <laughs> Honestly, with our education system, I doubt most people would understand what a pilgrim is. They'd be like, <laughs> huh? What you talking about? Pilgrims. Uh, yeah, I, I love I love this character. Um, well, I let's throw, let's throw it out there, guys. Um, if, if Tom Donovan wouldn't have killed Liberty Valance, right? What would have happened? Right? Probably, probably that uh, Liberty Valance would have won out with vigilante justice. It's, it, it, it is it's it's it, that's what i love about this movie it's 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 a great moral dilemma right he had to do it there's no way that ransom was going to win this gun fight. i don't think it's so much like i don't think the moral dilemma is if he had to do it or not i think it's more of how he went about it yeah because you know but like I've said, you know, if you hide your kill, you know, that just seems dishonorable. Like, you know, there was obviously a reason for it, and a lot of people agreed with why he did it. But if you keep it secret, it's like it's something to hide, you know, it's like you're ashamed of it. Right. Um well, he wanted he wanted ransom to get credit for doing it because that gave him a lot of political brownie points, I guess you could say. Right. So if ransom would have got credit for doing it, then ransom could actually go to this like constitutional convention, right? And change not constitutional convention, but like state convention for statehood, right? And actually bring change. So uh, without that, without him getting credit for the kill, maybe maybe he wouldn't have had as much political leeway to, to change things. But even even that bothers Ransom, right? Like he thinks about withdrawing from the nomination at the end right? because he doesn't want his career to be ba- to be built on, you know, on is the fact that he killed somebody, right? That's completely hypocritical to his ideas.
Myra, are you over there at, Le or at Logan? Yeah. You wrote about, like, fascism versus democracy. Right? You want to tell us what you talked about? I just thought it reminded me of uh, those two things because, like, the town was really standing for freedom. And then uh, basically, like, that guy was trying to uh, make it to where people were not going to have as much freedom to, like, bear arms or just, like, not bear arms and have opinions and not have opinions. And it was just, it reminded me a lot of people wanting to have control over other people and being scared of uh, not being able to have your own opinion and your own choices and freedom and stuff. <laughs> I, yeah, that's a, that's a great fault. Um, I think to back you up there, like the liberty's intimidation of the press, right? Definitely, definitely backs you up there. The fact that he wants to shut down the press, right? He wants to, like, he if he actually physically harms the owner of the paper. Right, that that's a very that's a very fascist thing to do. Right. So there's nothing more un-American than than a free than not allowing for a free press. Right. That's that's part of our that's one of the first amendments we have, right? Freedom of the of the speech and the press. Right. So. Um, if you want to read liberty as as almost like a Hitler like character, right? I don't think that's far. I don't think that's far off. I think I think you're right to point that out. Or at least even even if not fascist, at least authoritarians. Right? We also got to remember this is during the height of the Cold War. Right? So. Um, you know, this could also maybe be read as like a Russian allegory if you want, if you want. Right. Of course, you guys know Joseph Stalin was an awful like authoritarian dictator, right? In, in communist Russia, the communist Soviet Union. So which whichever one bad guy you want to read liberty as, right? Is, is Stalin or, or Hitler, right? Stalin in many ways was worse than Hitler, right? They don't tell you about that in history class because he happened to be on our side in World War II. He was just as evil of a guy as Hitler was. Oh, Stalin? Are we talking about World War II history? Yeah, Stalin's just as evil as Hitler was. If that's oh, yeah, right. no, he... He killed way more people than Hitler ever dreamed of. He killed 20 million of his own people. He made the night of uh, broken glass look like nothing. Uh, Stalin literally assassinated every single one of his political adversaries until there were none left. Hitler only did a couple until the rest of them fell in line. Stalin just got rid of all of them. And even still today, Stalin is viewed as one of the most tyrannical rulers in history, but was a very stoic figure and is still very respected in Russian culture. Yeah, he's, he's known for his famous quote, right? One death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, his, uh, that's his great quote. Uh, <laughs> We actually had a dress up day one day for history class for presentation, and I was Joseph Stalin. And sorry, I'm just coming back to the conversation. My mom needed it for something. I would, I would like to see that. I think I still have the can somewhere around here that I use. What is it? What do the rest of you guys think about Myra's point here, right? Do you, you see this political subtext in the film that we're alluding to? Maybe Cold War politics or post-World War II politics? Well, 
No, I just saw Western. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. West Westerns, in many ways, are all about politics, right? It's an ideal. It's an ideological genre, right? It's, in, it's in many ways we shouldn't overthink them, right? But in many ways, you do. We do as well, right? The movie beats you over the head with political messages. Like there's the great scene where they're all at school. They're learning about American democracy. That that movie kind of slaps you over the face with politics right there. You guys remember who read the quote from the Declaration of Independence? Remember which character read it? Was it, Pompey. was it Pompey? It was Pompey, right? So you got exactly right. So Pompey reads, all men are created equal. Right? Jimmy then Ransom says, well, most of the time or, or something like that, right? It's not insignificant that they chose the almost slave-like character, right? He's probably pretty much John Wayne's slave in the film. I didn't even think about it when he read that. Did, did you not? No, I didn't. Didn't even cross my mind. That's a. That's a. That's definitely it. Though. Right. It's that's a pretty. This is right during the height of the civil rights movement, right? The early '60s. Maybe a couple of years before you went up. But that was a, um, you know, that was a cool little point in the film. Yeah. Uh, I, it would have been really interesting to see a lot more uh, people of color in the film because at that time, a lot of African American people were moving. Uh, I think it was called the Great Migration of Harlem that they were moving out westward at an alarming rate because of things like Jim Crow and the civil rights era beginning, uh, you know, beginning to turn more violent and a lot of protests were happening. Like, I believe around the same time, I was looking it up the other day, but I believe around the same time that this movie was being filmed that uh, Martin Luther King had his famous march. Mm. Uh, yeah, I know at the end of the 1800s, I don't know a lot about like African Americans moving west, but I do know that a lot of them like move north to the big cities. Like this is the time period where a lot of like former slaves in the south move up north to cities like Chicago or New York, right? Philadelphia. This is where the city, especially see a lot of migration of former slaves in the south up, up north. I mean, why wouldn't they move north, right? And Jim Crow is still heavy in effect. Yeah. Um, it says here that I, look, I just looked this up. Uh, the Great Harlem Migration, as some would call it, is the great west and northern expansion of African Americans from the south into western regions like the area that would become known as uh, Texas, San Diego, and California, as well as northern places like New York. Uh, and the reason that it's called the Harlem Migration is because the biggest population of people moving of African, African Americans became a, a place called Harlem, which we all know what Harlem is. And yeah, um, this film was filmed just uh, about six months before Martin Luther King's uh, big march. Yeah, this, this is a pretty common theme in John Ford's works. Like if you watch his other film, I mentioned The Searchers, you know, that movie is all about Native Americans, but he uses Native Americans as an allegory for 
or African Americans and civil rights and stuff in that movie. So uh, he Ford was a pretty progressive guy when it came to this type of thing. I don't know if you guys knew that, but a lot of slaves in the South were named Roman names too. So like we the fact that we have a slave named Pompeii here, right? You know, that's that was a pretty common thing that slave owners did was name their slaves after an ancient Greek and Roman culture. I don't know if you guys knew that. Pom Pompey's role in the film is pretty, he doesn't say much, right? He's always there to back Tom up. But um, the, the, what, pretty much the one line he gets in the film is that line. So it's, it's, that's a pretty cool coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, I, think, I think Ford meant that. They use they use these old Greek and Roman names as a means of disparaging them, right? It was it was like our irony for them. Yeah, that that was a big uh, thing they did to demoralize them, which mm, I, it's really hard to say if that really worked or not because you know having a name like Julius or Augustus or like there were several slaves uh, that were named like after Roman and Greek gods just as like a I don't know it was a very it was a very weird time period but imagine having the name Zeus like how cool would you feel even being you know after you get to be a freed slave it's like what's your name Zeus like <laughs> Yeah, Apollo, right? That that was a pretty commonly used one. Because when you think about the great character in Rocky, right? Apollo, Apollo Creed. Um, Mr. Edgar, is it all right if I skip out just a bit early? My mom is needing me to run to the store. Yeah, if you got to, you got to. I don't mind. Okay. Have I participated enough today? Uh, I would say I would say so. Okay. I just, <laughs> I just want to make sure I get my you know participation in. I don't want to leave and not get it. No, you're you're fine. All right. Uh, have a good day, everyone. See you next week for Unforgiven. Mm -hmm. What did you think about uh, Peabody in the film, Mr. Yeager? The He was the press guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought I mentioned earlier, like, the role of the press in the, in the film, um, the, especially the free press. That's how I've always viewed his role in the film, like especially the freedom of the press and like how essential that is to having a good democracy and when liberty threatens that right you know, that, that can bring about an authoritarian dictatorship almost right? so without without that character right that message definitely wouldn't have come through as clear what did you think of what do you think of the character uh, i thought he was pretty important for like making liberty be more of a of a bad guy in it because he talks about it in the newspaper plus he's a delegate and he helps ransom at the end you know um, like tells about ransom why he's so good why he should like keep going in the statehood and then plus he's an alcoholic he was pretty funny in the film. it was all like sitting around and they was like getting delicates and he wasn't he, he wanted something to drink and john wayne was like the bar's closed and he was sitting there getting pissed off because he wanted a beer I thought that was hilarious. And he gives the great speech at the end, which gets Ransom nominated too. Yeah, that was that was a good speech. You, know, you got you got lots of good oratory 
pretty close to the end. Right? First, the guy who nominated the cattle, the cattle guy, and then he nominates Ransom. I love the Gus. I love the cattle guy speech. Right? He says, "I'm not going to read off a piece of paper today," and he throws the piece of paper down. <laughs> Yeah, then it's, then the, he picks it up and it's just a blank piece of paper. Yeah, I, I, love yeah. I love that. I, I like when they put like the uh, the rope around him. I guess to show that he's like important or something. And then all you hear in the background is hang him. <laughs> 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 I, I had me laughing right there. Yeah, they were they had the lasso around them, right? Yeah, just, yeah. Shit, that was no, that was pretty good. I'll tell you now, these Western movies are growing on me. Are they? Yeah, I don't really like black and white movies, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting into these. These past two, anyway. Yeah, they're, they're, they're one of my favorite genres. I, in this class, my two favorites are horror and Westerns. I, 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 those are my two favorites by far. I like How how the rest of you guys feel, like, especially after these two? Uh, is is your view of the western changing? I like, think is it is it growing on you beyond just the boring movies you watch with, with grandma on Sunday afternoons? Or like like we talked about the other day. No, no thoughts. No thoughts. It makes me want to be a sheriff. <laughs> I'm gonna get my boots and a hat. Marshall, Marshall McCoy. Marshall McCoy. Bring to it. Yeah, pop something. The leader type another message. Yeah. Hey, you want to see a uh, Western masterpiece? What's that? Uh, I'll send it to you in an email. It's my senior uh, year capstone video. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was on, it was on Billy the Kid. Yeah, that's that's some great stories like the Billy the Kid and. And you have like the Doc Holiday stories and all that. Leah says that their westerns are growing on her a little bit. As a kid, she hated them. I was the same way, you know. When I was a kid, I, I wouldn't go anywhere near these things. Like when I became adult like I started like really getting into mostly because I studied a lot of American history and stuff in college that's when I really started to to get into these things I took a class in college on the American West that's what we did in the whole class like rather than the history Nothing but westerns. That's that's that really got me into it. Here, here we are today. Yeah, our next our next one up that we're going to talk about next week is uh, Unforgiven. And, uh, Unforgiven subverts a lot of these roles. Like, um, you guys will find out, like, the sheriff in Unforgiven is pretty much the bad guy. Right? It shows what happens when even, like, people in positions of power let the power get to their heads. Right? So I'll definitely be interested to hear what you guys have to say about that next week. The Unforgiven's a movie where there's no good guys. Everybody in the movie is kind of bad. And that one is, of course, in color, right? That one was made in the 90s.
even just calling this film a western though is a little tricky. I mean, this, anytime you see like a top twenty movies in American cinema list, like Liberty Valance is usually one of the most talked about ones. Like most film critics think this is not just a great western, but a great film in general. Sort of like how I said um, Chinatown was also viewed that, or not Chinatown, but Casablanca. Right, Casablanca is a film that subverts its genre and it's become an icon. This film has too. One thing that I haven't got to yet, and um, this is how I'm going to bring Kalen into the class. Right, and that's that's the idea of the film is settling the West. And Kaylin, uh, you, you brought up something in your post about how Ransom kind of helps make the West a cultivated garden, right? He turns something desolate into a garden, right? You want to elaborate on what you wrote about on the discussion board? Uh, well, I basically <laughs> just said that, well, he has like the ideology that like what he thinks of like them like pioneering it, I guess you could say, <laughs> is what is right because it's what he's used to compared to like what people like Liberty think. So he thinks he took something and made it good. All right. It's, it's hard it's hard to argue that he didn't, right? You know, there's trains going to this town now, right? There's businesses starting there. Um, he he took what was dead, right, and made it made it in a live place. The cactus blossom is is a great symbol there. Right? If you guys wondered what the purpose of the cat the cactus blossom was, as you guys know, cactuses only blossom like once a year, but. Um, that's the fact that they use cactus blossoms on Tom Donovan's grave, right? That, that's a pretty cool thing to show, like, the West as a, as a garden. There's all, whenever you look back at American history, right, lots of times the nature is depicted in two ways. Right? You either have it as a beautiful garden, like an Eden-like paradise, where you see people see it as, as a um, wilderness, right? a wilderness that's meant to be tamed. And well, this movie's all about the taming of the wilderness. It's, it's not insignificant that the film ends with showing a train, right? It's, a, it's not insignificant. Mm -hmm. The trains often symbolize like progress, right? the move towards a different type of America. The, the railroad, the railroads built the West, right? As, as far as that goes. But that that's a very ideological message in the movie too, right? America is this cultivated garden it was started as a wilderness now it's a garden I should probably also bring up the great quote from the movie right and that uh, that's at the end and that's uh, well right the great the great quote. It was something to the, let me, let me Google it real quick. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Keegan, you asked me earlier about the role of the press in the movie, right? Um, tell, tell me what you think about that quote. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. I just think it's funny that the quote came from another press person. Like it was the editor 
Mm -hmm. I thought that was that made that quote even a little bit better. Yeah, but that that's right though. Uh, of course, um, we were talking earlier about ransom, right? Like, was Tom wrong to shoot Liberty in cold blood? Right. Well, but maybe that's not the point, right? Maybe that's how history is built. It's hard to argue that our history isn't isn't mythology in some way. You you, you just blew my mind. Now that I'm thinking about it like that, yeah. I mean, people that we know that are like real great in history, they might not even have really did the things that they said they did. Exactly, right? Yeah, that that movie, that movie even like the movie even like raises that question, right? Like how much do we know is, is accurate? Right? What about the behind the scenes people? People weren't interested in real facts, right? People love the legends and the myth. Well, well, any of the rest of you guys have a thought on that? American myth history is mythology, perhaps? Any of you get any of you guys taking American history right now? You know, the history, the study of history is very ideological, right? Like, especially in high school. Like if you guys took history in high school, you, you pretty much get the mythology version of history, right? America really doesn't do any wrong. Right? Um, usually when you get to college history, things start to get a lot more complicated. Politicians pretty much govern what happens in high school history. So you usually get more of an accurate view when you get to college. Sometimes it depends on your professor, I suppose. I don't know if we got any history buffs in the room. Uh, anything else we haven't talked about? Yeah, yeah, but there, there is the steak scene. I want to talk about that real quick. Uh, I love that scene in this movie. It's so tense. Right, it's like a three-minute standoff between John Wayne and Liberty Valance, right? About who's going to pick up the steak, right? It's it's a it's such a great scene. Um, any of you guys have any thoughts on that scene, especially how it was built? How how what how like, the tension is coming out in the scene? I, th I thought the scene made sense, but like Liberty was like kind of toying with Ransom. It looked like kind of just laughing, let his ego get to him a little bit. Yeah, he trips Ransom, right? Makes him drop the stake on the floor. Yeah. Then it becomes almost like a pissing contest, right? Between Liberty and, and Tom. Tom's like, that's my steak, Pilgrim. <laughs> <laughs> Liberty, Liberty won't, won't do it. Right? <laughs> then uh, Ransom just gets ticked off that the pissing contest, right? He just picks it up anyway. Right? Yeah. And It's yeah, it's a it's a great moment in the film as far as like building suspense. It shows that Tom's just as much of a badass as Liberty. Right? Tom doesn't need a posse behind him like Liberty has. It's hard. 
Liberty probably wouldn't be as bad of a guy, right, if he didn't have this posse always behind him. He kind of reminds me of uh, Johnny Ringo in Tombstone, kind of like with the way that like he carries himself. So like the whole steak scene kind of reminded me of um, the that one scene when Doc Holliday and Johnny Ringo kind of get into it at the poker table, and he just kind of walks out. Yeah, I, I never thought of that before. But, but there is a good similarity between those two scenes. He kind of, Liberty also, he kind of like, he stands like Johnny Ringo too. If you, I don't know, I, I, I guess just because I've watched Tombstone a lot, that's kind of what I base all Western movies off of. But like, for example, when Liberty kind of like flips the coin, and he's kind of like standing with his hand on his hip and his leg poked out. It just reminds me of that scene. I thought that was kind of unique. Yeah, he, he flips the coin on the ground. He's like, I'll pay for your new steak. Now, Liberty always holds his hands on his hips, right? That, that, that's what Elsie always does. Yeah, post, posture and things like that were pretty important in that scene. Like Tom was severely outgunned, but, but he had Pompey backing him up, right? So the, the gang would have ganged up on him if it wasn't for Pompey. I had a student write like a five page paper on that scene, just that scene once. It, it was one of the best papers I've ever read and how important it is to the film. And establishing all these characters. If you took that scene out of the film, that's something that something that film analysis does, guys. If you think about it, like this is going to be what your midterm paper is going to be on. Actually, you guys will pick a scene from a film and analyze just one scene. Right. So the question I'll ask you guys is: if you take that one scene out of the film. How would the film be fundamentally different? Right. Well, if you take that steak scene out of this film, right? Like a lot of like what drives Liberty, what drives Tom, even Ransom, right? A lot of a lot would be missing to all those characters. As we keep watching films in the class. If you notice a scene that especially strikes out, that sticks out to you, make note of it, because it might be a possible paper idea once we get to the midterm. Well, um, that pretty much exhausts everything that I wanted to talk about with, with the movie. We could probably let you guys go a little early today. Good conversation, though. good conversation. I feel like our conversations are getting getting better the further we go. Right, um, I'm gonna pause real quick. <laughs>